So today I am interviewing David Lee Sisko, and he is the author of at least a couple of children's books, The Skin That You Live In and Science People. And so today we're going to talk about those and sort of the messages he's trying to share within these books. So my name is Jackie, and I am the host of the Homeschool Think Tank Parenting Podcast, and I am also the host of the Homeschool Think Tank video channel, where so wherever you may be seeing this video. And David, welcome to the podcast. I'm glad thank, to have you. Thank you. Thank you. Let me just clarify. I'm the illustrator of those books. Oh, yes, I know this. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. There is a difference. There is a, there difference. Is a difference. So who wrote the books then? What so so um, the, the, first, the first book, uh, which I illustrated, was The Skin You Live In, which is now in its 19th printing. It's, it's, it's oh, done really, really wow. well and was recently translated. We translated it into Spanish, and which is available, I think, online. And um, uh, over the summer, we, we translated it into French. That book was written by um, Michael Tyler, a Chicago author who wrote the book um, a long time ago, 19 years ago. Uh, he's African-American, was married to a Caucasian woman and had a mixed race child. And their child was getting picked on at school for being mixed race. And so he wanted to write a delightful book about racial acceptance that takes out all politics and is a fun read for parents, but it talks about skin color in positive ways, comparing skin to pumpkin pie, um, apples, uh, birthday cake, things like that, things that kids love. And it's a very fun book that has done really, really, really well. And, um, and then recently I illustrated um, a book called Science People uh, which is 50 fun portraits of people in the sciences uh, starting way back in history uh, to the present. So it's a historical look at science with the famous people you know, and then um, a survey of people in science from all over the world who are doing interesting things in science from, and they live in different countries. Oh, how fun. So I have not looked at science people yet because I actually thought when I when we booked the interview that this has not come out yet. Here's oh, thank you for showing it. Yes. I love it. And do you have a copy of the skin that you live in handy? Like I, I, I ran upstairs and I <laughs> I think I, I gave my my last home copy to someone who who needed it. So sadly I don't have it. But it's Isn't that um, funny. It's a very fun book and uh -huh. uh, just remember the skin you live in. You can get it on Amazon. You can get it at yeah. lots of bookstores. Yeah. And I always include, uh, for anybody who's new to this podcast or video channel, a link that goes with the interview that I share. It will be right in the show notes of the podcast or the description of say YouTube. And you can find everything you need right there. I, I do a little bio about you and any links that are relevant in this podcast episode, just so everyone knows that. Excellent. So, so David, what inspired, well, tell me more about science people, where you really started that from and how you brought that forward and how you chose some of the characters in the book, you know, the representations, how that went sure. out exactly. Uh, so, I was a, a, a student who went to public school and um, I always enjoyed the sciences. Um, everything from learning the basic stuff about like human anatomy and um, simple things that you're taught in grade school, which actually I, I don't remember what that was now because it was a really, really long time ago. But one of the things that I remember vividly was when I was in high school, um, I had a wonderful high, uh, high school teacher who took us um, to the Natural History Museum in Chicago and basically gave us a list of 25 questions that we had to run around the museum and get the answers. And that made learning really, really fun and exciting. And also I've always been in love with, with museums since I was a, a young lad. Uh, my parents, neither of my parents went to college but they loved going to museums. And so I visited the 
I grew up outside of Chicago in Hammond, Indiana, and in Chicago, where is where I live now, um, has some great museums. We have the um, uh, uh, Museum of Science and Industry, um, which is all about technology and uh, science, but but also looking at industry and technological advances. And then we have the Field Museum of Natural History, which is a collection of of natural history and um, amazing exhibits, um, dioramas um, covering everything that's all about natural sciences. And uh, anyway, so I've always had a fondness for that. And um, a while back, I started doing portraits of composers. And then I got a request to do a portrait of an architect um, who practiced out of Chicago, Frank Lloyd Wright. And there was a big success with the image I did of Frank Lloyd Wright because I really believe that the, 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 as an artist and illustrator, you can bring your own thoughts to the table. You can, you can bring your contribution. To me, it's all about contributions and the importance of imagination. So when I drew the image of Frank Lloyd Wright, I made his, um, what he was wearing look like one of his stained glass windows or shapes that are reminiscent of Frank Lloyd Wright buildings that you see in his designs. And it, it was received really nicely. So um, I wound up being at a, at a party for the um, Museum of Science and Industry, which was celebrating um, the, there was, there was a big exhibition a really long time ago um, to celebrate at the time, <laughs> this would not be celebrated today, but celebrated was the 500th anniversary of, Chicago, of, of Columbus discovering America, which was the Columbian exhibition of 1890, let's say it's 1895. Um, but uh, Frank Lloyd Wright worked on that, several architects, and so the museum asked me to celebrate the key figures from the exhibition because it's always being looked at as being an important, it was the first world, one of the first world fairs where people from all over came, came together. And that then turned into a relationship with the Museum of Science and Industry who said, why don't you draw six really famous scientists? So we, we started with Einstein and Madame Curie, um, Stephen Hawking, uh, the list goes on and on and on. And then I enjoyed doing it. And so when COVID happened um, and I was at home, I would just randomly think, I wonder who's the most famous scientist from Mexico. And I would look up, I would just type in as a search, famous science from Mexico, scientist from Mexico, and I would find someone. The same thing with India and South Africa and Thailand and Japan and China, um, the Middle Eastern countries. And I started building this portfolio of people in science from around the world. And um, I met with a publisher who got really excited about the project. So together between the publisher's team and myself, we came up with, up with a list of 50 people to celebrate. So people in different countries and maybe from some countries we haven't even really heard of those people, am I right? Correct, 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 yeah. yeah the book really tries to be very inclusive. I uh, love that. And also sort of tell the story of, the, of each individual scientist who um, the um, author of the science book, um, those are written by Lindsay, um, Lindsay Sinclair. And, um, uh, what we found fascinating was that what was amazing about some of these scientists is that they necessarily were not the best student in their youth, <laughs> or maybe they dropped out of school or they pursued a bunch of different things, but eventually they, they wound up in the sciences. So a, a really interesting person to me who's fascinating, who a lot of young people, especially children adore is Sue Hendrickson who was the paleontologist who found the largest T-Rex skeleton. And um, she found it uh, out West and um, it is, has been put back together and is on display at the Field Museum of Natural History and is their number one draw for young people to see. It, it's beloved, it's beloved. If you haven't been to Chicago, come to the Field Museum and go see, it's nicknamed Sue after her, after Sue Hendrickson. So it's oh, called okay. Sue the T-Rex. 
But Sue Hendrickson um, was not the perfect student. She was not the straight A student. She, in fact, dropped out of high school, um, didn't like it, and then took up scuba diving and then was diving on, on wrecks and finding sunken treasure. Somehow that led her to working with um, paleontologists and she went into the field of paleontology and then went on this dig and she discovered this amazing find, which was this great big dinosaur skeleton, perfectly intact, which was the first time that, it, that they had found one that big. So I think she's really fascinating that here's this woman who has an interesting path. Um, and I think for young people today, because not everyone fits those boxes. No one, not everybody is a straight A student um, and everyone has very varying challenges. Um, but, but what the book celebrates is, is what these people did, which makes them interesting. And, and it celebrates their contribution to the world. They've, they've all done something that has made the world a better place. I love this. And uh, the whole T-Rex thing for a moment, I, last summer we went to Museum of the Rockies in Bozeman and they have one of, I thought it was the largest T-Rex, but maybe I'm remembering wrong, but it, it's a very large and very impressive. Oh, cool. cool. <laughs> so, yeah. So I, also, so the, also the book, um, the science book has more women than men scientists. Um, okay, now was that intentional or just it, the way it, it, it turned it, out? It, it was just because um, for a long time, women have been left out of the picture. And so mm -hmm. we're trying to write that that wrong. So um, I wanted to show you, I don't know if you can see it, but- Yes, I can. Okay, so that, is, this is Mary Anning or Awning, Anning, um, who found the first marine dinosaur skeletons. And uh -huh. because she was a woman, she didn't get credit. Um, the when was that? Pardon? When was that? What year this do you is, think? Um, no. She lived no. from, she's very, very old. This is from 1799. She was born in 1799 and died in 1847. And she lived on the coast of England, but uh, women were not allowed to join the archeological societies of Great Britain, even though she was finding all of these things on her own, men were able to take the credit, which, which, which sadly happened quite a lot. Um, there's another, anyway, but she celebrated in the book and there's actually, a, I think there's a, a movie or two about her. She's really quite fascinating. So she found this marine um, sea sort of dinosaur, marine mammal um, skeleton on, on, the, on the coast of England. Okay, so your book is to, it seems like both of your books are a lot about celebrating diversity in yes. various, you know, illustrating people in, say, the skin that you live in of yes. all, all different colors, and in the science people, celebrating science, yes, but we're also making a point to recognize women, men, people of various um, origins and yes. Yes. cultures, basically. Yes. Yeah. So that we're really just sort of sharing that we're all capable of yes. doing yeah. these great things. Yeah, yeah. And and um, in the science book, um, so I'm going to show you a picture. Um, so, so with the image of Galileo, mm -hmm. he is looking at a telescope because he is credited for being one of the first people to develop the telescope, mm -hmm. um, which goes, which in Galileo lived in the, 15, he, well, he died in 1642. And okay. um, he was a big thinker. And um, in the time that he lived in was very conservative times that uh, it was controlled by the church. And so being the Catholic church in Rome. So his findings were then taken beyond the borders of the Rome, Holy Roman Empire and wound up in the Netherlands that was, um, Protestant. And so they have that, that all of his findings were sort of celebrated there. Even though he was a man of the Renaissance, um, times are changing all the time as we as we live in changing times here. It's all relevant. It's it's very mm -hmm. relevant to the bigger picture. Yeah. Well, what I like about this uh, for homeschooling parents, 
is you can actually, especially with science people, it seems like you can use that book as a springboard exactly. for a lot of other, say, unit studies, yeah. Yeah. or just you can really integrate a lot of history with the science. Exactly. I, I see a lot of ways that a parent could take this book and use it to just help garner interest in other areas for your children. And even let's say you lead a homeschooling group or something like that, you could probably structure an entire year's worth of curriculum for that group around this book. You could really focus on one person every single week. How many people are illustrated 50, again? 50. 50. I yeah. mean, how perfect is that? Oh, <laughs> you might not even be able to complete it all in a year if you just yeah. chose one person a week, but you could literally integrate geography into this by yes. looking at where the person comes from. You could do writing topics around it. Your students could do their own art projects around this. Like, you know, David, I don't know how much you know about homeschooling, but there are lots of different books where people, homeschooling parents take the, the book and create an entire unit or curriculum around this. You could litter this book and hand <laughs> make it for people because it's really interesting. And I yeah. think I, I do like the approach with this and how you're just sharing about all types of people. And it's, it is very inclusive. And I like it's that very inclusive, but, And also what's unique about the book mm -hmm. is that each scientist is pictured with a tool that they have that they may have used or something that relates to their scientific field so in uh, louis pasteur who is credited uh, credited as sort of the father of vaccines um i actually looked up his actual microscope and did research to find what it looked like and so um it's i've redrawn it right there so in, a, in all of the pictures that usually include, so like Thomas Edison has the first light bulb. So mm -hmm. the book is meant to be, to make education fun, but to, to uh, um, so like Madame Curie, who discovered uranium, which is green, <laughs> she's wearing a green outfit, she's looking at uranium. And um, sadly, um, she, she, she died from too much exposure to uranium. So um, everything, everything, all the pictures are, are intended to inspire a young person to read further, that, that, that I'm trying to um, invite your imagination that if you find a picture interesting, you'll want to read the, the short bio about the person. Yeah, I, uh, my mind is just like going a hundred miles an hour as I'm looking at these pictures. So I'm thinking like for a homeschooling parent, depending on the age of the child you're reading this book to, if I were to take this book and let's say they were maybe upper elementary, I honestly would want to read the book, the text to the child before they look at the picture. I would look at it myself read it. And I wouldn't even let him see the cover of your book initially and say, all right, let's try to draw this picture. And because you have your very own style. And for anybody who's listening to this, just on the podcast, you've got to go watch this video. I will have the link in the podcast description because David has a very unique uh, style. But then I like to get your kids to just sort of like, try to imagine this, draw it for yourself. And now let's look at the picture because every child has their own style. Yes. And, you Before, know, now with a yeah. younger child, I would just do it right away. Just like, let's, it's a picture book, you know? Yeah, yeah. But then I'm like, you're, you could use this to help your kids like, okay, what kind of art project do you want to make around this? Do you want to do a diorama, a painting? Do you want to do graphic design on the computer to do this yourself? You know, um, like this, I, I love this. I'm just looking at this and the wheels are turning as to how parents could really take this book and use it for so much more. Because I mean, there's, you could literally, you know, there are books about all of these people you could find age appropriate books for your kids, help them. You could, they could even just choose just a few of the people and really dive deep, but you never yeah. know 
um, where your book will just help open up uh, exploration. I can, the author is slipping my mind right now, but I know, oh, in my, is it thir- the 39 Clues books? Uh, the, um, my daughter, when my oldest daughter, especially when she was younger, she loved books and there was a lot of history involved. And I cannot even begin to tell you the trail she went down because a book inspired her to want to learn more about that. And there's nothing, you know, this is exactly the same yeah, where yeah. it's, the book is a, an inspiration point. It's not an ending point. Um, so I, I was going to, I'm going to show you another picture. Um, so, so Ozak Izu, who is a young scientist mm-hmm. uh, who grew up in Nigeria How old? and um, where uh, the electricity wasn't consistent, where she lived in, in the small town she lived in in Nigeria, the power would go out and her parents were both very bright doctors but her grades weren't good enough to get into medical school. But her wish was that she could watch TV without the power going out. So she studied natural power and natural energy. So um, she's a scientist of windmills and hydro energy that it just takes advantage of what's happening in the world to create energy. And, and I, think, I find that really fascinating. It's something I think young people would really relate to because it, it was just, it came out of a, she used her imagination and her knowledge to satisfy a practical need. She, she wanted to watch TV more often and not have the power go out so the TV would die. But um, uh, so, so the book is filled with, with people like that who wound up being on this rather extraordinary path and pursued their interests. Um, and and being, me being an artist, um, you are met with, 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 with not everything goes according to plan. Not everything always works out. You don't get, I don't get every project that I apply for, but when I do, they're amazing projects. I'm very fortunate. Um, I do all kinds of things like public art. Um, I design mosaics that are at a public train station. Well, I just, you've been recognized art. like yeah. with the White House. So yeah, yeah, you yeah. Know. Yeah, and, David and, Lee Cisco is pretty big. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I've discovered. But, you, but you're it, a but big it, deal, David. <laughs> oh, thank you. But, it, but it all has really come from the cool things that I get to do are because I follow up on my interests. So um, how this whole, whole book came to be was that someone at the Museum of Science and Industry said, why don't you draw six portraits of famous scientists. And together we came up with what that list was. That was then a springboard to being appreciated. And then when I sort of was discovered by a pub, by this publisher who is, the, the, the books are published by Trope, T-R-O-P-E books. Mm-hmm. And it was actually a man I worked with a really long, I won't say how long ago, but it was a long time ago. Um, there used to be a famous department store in Chicago called Marshall Fields that sadly doesn't exist anymore, but he was an art director there and I did, um, illustrations for ads for Marshall Fields. And, uh, he went on to another job before the computer was invented. That's impossible to, to comprehend that there was a time before computers, but, um, and it was also before cell phones. So, uh, a year ago, March not this March, but the previous March, he found me out of the blue and said, um, I'm publishing books and my wife and I were talking and we thought you probably have some things you'd love to publish. And I said, I have this whole series of portraits, portraits of people in different fields. So our, um, we just finished a book. All, we also, the first book was um, LGBTQ people in the arts, which is um, 50 people um, who, happened to have been LGBTQ um, and created to, contributed to arts and culture. And then the science book was, was the next project. We're currently working on a, um, uh, a book on the history of classical music um, and also being with the effort to be more inclusive. So in classical music, it's mostly old white European men, but we are showcasing lots of women 
um, from all over the world. Uh, classical music is, is a field that is really um, trying to catch up and be much more inclusive. So they're not just programming um, music of Beethoven, Bach, and Brahms. Now they're, they're uh, there, there was there was an amazing um, African American woman named Florence Price who actually was from Chicago, lived in Chicago, and um, she's been dead for a while now. But she's sort of having this renaissance where they're finding scores of pieces of music that this African American woman wrote, and it's being performed in concert halls and on the radio. And so the book is another wonderful pairing of helping young people learn more about these amazing people who are contributing to the world or or if they've died, they contributed to the world back in their day. And then we're working on a book on people in fashion and then architects and writers. And the, the list just keeps sort of going, but they're really, um, they're very inclusive. And, and my goal as an artist is to make the pictures really engaging mm -hmm. that, that you'll, you'll want to, um, I'm laughing because my dog is playing with a bone upstairs. I can hear, can hear it. <laughs> I can hear it. I'm so sorry about that. Um, it's okay. I'm glad you acknowledged it though, because then yeah. when people listen on the podcast, yeah, yeah. they're like, what is yeah, that? I, I have, I have, I have a, a little dachshund who's blonde, blonde cream colored dachshund, very short legs, but um, is a puppy. And if I have a zoom call, he gets really jealous and yes. is barking all the time and just being uh, uh, impossible. So I, I, he's upstairs. You know what, dogs and kids boat. happen on this podcast. from Okay, time great. Time, so okay. no worries. Okay. <laughs> yeah. um, but anyway, I, I, I love drawing and um, I'm an example of, of someone who luckily was encouraged um, all the time. I was very bright, but I was dyslexic. Um, so being able to write, I suffered horribly in in math that's why i'm so glad it's not just stem but it's steam that they've added the arts into into learning because because i was the art kid that the arts saved me and um uh i, I was the kid that won poster contests all the time I, I was very good at drawing it came to me naturally but you have to work at it you have to train i went to art school but also my interest in other things like music and science have led me to earning a living doing just that, sort of using that as what I draw. Like I draw every single day. It's like training for the Olympics. You have to practice, practice, practice. Or, and it also, it's also for homeschool parents, it's about solving problems in a creative way. So when I work on large scale projects, I just finished a wonderful project for a public school in uh, outside of Chicago in Manetka, but it's this public school that has an interesting program. It goes from K to uh, fourth grade, but but what's interesting about it, which is something that homeschool parents could, could do something similar, is that at this school, the third graders teach the second graders about the bird about birds, the birds of Illinois. So that was something we wanted to celebrate with this mosaic mural. So I drew let's say I drew seven different birds. Um, and uh, I had lots of conversations with the art teacher, with the principal about what would be appropriate to, to draw and make this all work. And so then I had, so the name of the school is Greeley Elementary, which begins with a G. So I drew a large topiary G. So topiary is when you make a bush or a tree take on a shape, like, you can shape it in the shape of a dinosaur or a heart or a star or circles. But this is a is the capital G with leaves in it and then branches and there are birds flying around it. So they're very big. So there's a blue jay, a cardinal, um, an owl. Uh, there's a little graduation bird with a mortarboard. A mortarboard is what um, kids wear when they graduate special kind of hat with a tassel. So that's on the top of the tree. But um, it was a matter of, of, of figuring out how to communicate, which is sort of the basis of what I do all the time is good, clear communication. So that in my pictures, you get a sense of what I'm thinking. And, and, I, and I wanna communicate that. I hope, I hope that makes sense, but yeah. it's the kind of, but, I, but that to me was such a good uh, problem that had to be solved. How can I show the birds of Illinois, I don't have to draw them 
so that they're identical or that they're realistic, I, they're based on the shapes that make up the bird. The cardinal has an interesting shape. The blue jay is blue and has an interesting shape. So um, sort of studying and looking up what these birds look like and then breaking them down into simple shapes that communicate, oh, that's, that's, that's a blue jay, that's a cardinal. And it's the kind of thing that a third grader would then take a second grader and point to everything and tell them what the birds are. So I know within that is something that parents homeschooling could come up with a similar project that they can get older kids to teach younger kids and sort of share the excitement of that, dis that discovery of learning. Absolutely. You know, David, because you are so about diversity and inclusion and all of those things, this is something I've often said is um, it's like we celebrate all things diverse except the way people learn and in our education system it historically has been pretty exclusive like yeah. I excelled in the education system because I'm really good at the things they want you to be good at right. however my younger sister really struggled because she is probably a whole lot more like you so creative like she can draw anything. She should be an illustrator for Hallmark, right? She yeah. makes beautiful cakes. She has gifts that the public education system historically does not celebrate. And that's something I try to help encourage homeschooling parents to do is recognize that your children have different gifts and they may not be what we have been trained as a society to value. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. And, and the, but the one thing that I found fascinating is like, working on a big public art project, like the, the school project I just told you about, mm -hmm. um, it, it also ties into math in, yes. in an interesting way. It's like, I have to take measurements. I have to draw it to scale. Then um, I'm given, then I have to come up with how much is this going to cost? Sometimes people already know we have X amount of dollars to spend on this. And then I have to figure out, can I get people to work so, so that at the end of the day, we're at the same number. Often we're not. So I'll have to say, you know, I need $5,000 more to complete this task. And so it's, it's about, it becomes a math story problem. You mm -hmm. know, um, how much do five apples and three oranges cost? And I, I just keep thinking that I, I'm a living math story problem all the time. That, that even though I'm just making a picture, it goes beyond that, that I have, I have math, I have to use math and, and make sure that everything adds up uh, at the end of the day. And that's, that's a big challenge. And then, and then also, oh, no. what's also really important is being able to express yourself, which, which thankfully I'm very, very good at talking and trying to distill it down to its simplest, the simplest way to say something to get the point across. Even if the point may be, a stretch of the imagination. And I think because of the fact that I'm challenged by uh, be, being dyslexic, that writing certain things becomes complicated, um, that in speaking, I, I try to, to speak in a, in a really clear manner, but get various points across, but, but do it in, a, in an inclusive way that, that hopefully we're, we're on the same path. You're, you're, you're understanding what I'm saying and it makes sense, um, which is also something that gets left out, especially like in the world of art, it becomes a world of giant words, words that the average person doesn't know what they mean. And so to me, I'm like, throw that away. Let's, let's, let's make this accessible for more people and figure out how to talk about something that's really complex in a simpler, more understandable form and then see where it goes. See, like these books are meant to be um, a conversation starter or a project starter, right? As you suggest, that uh, they can be used in, in various ways to sort of spread education and, um, and make it as accessible to a variety of students. Yes. David, can I ask you, we didn't plan on this, but can I ask you a little bit about your history and how you like, your experience in school and um, how you evolved as an artist, because now I'm getting more about you. I'm really curious. 
And I have to think other people might be too. Do you uh, mind sure. if I ask so, you to do this? Of course. Okay. Of course, so, of course. so what really got you like at what age did you like start identifying as sort of as an artist? Like you just like loved to draw or paint or early, what, early. what is your base medium drawing mostly? I'm mostly. Thinking. Yeah. Mostly, mostly it's, it's making sketches. Um, so, so just to quickly tell you how I, how I, the process of, of making these books is um, it's very easy because of Google and various search engines mm -hmm. at the computer. You just type in, what did Madame Curie look like? Marie Curie, what did she look like? And you, you see pictures. So then I'll, I'll study the various pictures. I'll look at her tools. I was very interested in the tools used in the sciences. Um, and then I'll just make quick sketches with a pencil. So I'm really good at drawing very, very quickly. And, um, and then once I have a sketch that I like, um, I developed this very simple process of taking a picture of my sketch with my iPhone and then sending that photo to my computer. And then I open up the program I work in, which is a Macintosh program called Illustrator. And um, I import the sketch. I make it a sub layer that I can't really touch. And then I build the illustration on top of it. And then when I've got it to where I want, where I want it, then I get, I, I, I say goodbye to the sketch. And then I just go to town and, and fill it in with shapes shapes and colors and blends and um but but it's that sort of like starting with a quick rough sketch that i can do sometimes in a matter of seconds or less than a minute and and then i just sort of go to town and and start building it but i was a kid that loved drawing early 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 on um i was always good at it uh and i was encouraged which which was which was wonderful so who encouraged you um, I would say my mom was really encouraging, um, the most. And, and then, uh, so I started off, uh, both of my parents were, um, uh, they, uh, immigrant, immigrant, immigrant children. My, my dad's parents were from Hungary. And so my mother's family was from Poland. So, um, they grew up in small Polish and Hungarian neighborhoods and they went to the to the, um, they went to Catholic school. So they thought, let's put him in Catholic school because that's what we did. And so when I got to Catholic school, it was the height of the baby boom. And so there were 75 kids in a class as opposed to 25 or whatever is considered the ideal thing. And I was drowning because I wasn't, I wasn't, I was dyslexic, but they didn't know what that was. So the nuns would say, well, we'll draw a picture. And so I would draw really elaborate pictures where everyone else is drawing something simple. And then my parents said, this is so expensive to go here. It's free to go to public school. So in public school, um, there was a bigger art program. And, and I just would like win the poster contest, win the science fair because the drawing was so good. And so I was always encouraged and encouraged. And then um, uh, when I was in high school, I, I, I participated in theater. And um, I just one day said, I'd like to design the set. And I didn't know how to do this, but I figured it out. And the, the, the teachers there sort of worked with me. And so I was designing these big productions from props to scenery to a sketch of what I thought the color of the costume should be. And then I went to art school. I went to the Cleveland Institute of Art, which is based on, um, at the time when I went there, there was a, a art school in Germany um, before World War II called the Bauhaus. And the Bauhaus thought that all artists should have a very varied background to be able to work in steel or metal or cloth and fabric, um, graphic design, illustration, paintings. So the school was sort of very based in all of the various forms of art. And so I got to dapple in a bunch of these things. And then when I got out of school, uh, I started, uh, designing ads for different companies and different projects. And I became known as the, as the visual problem solver. If somebody said, well, I don't know, I don't know what the right solution is. Let's call David Lee Cisco because he's, he's, he's a good thinker. And, um, but also I bring my joy, joy and love of drawing to, to all the projects that I do. And then also I just was very curious. So one day someone said, Hey, could you design a mosaic? And I said, sure I can. And so then I, I went about trying to learn about how to work in mosaics and 
meeting various people who did mosaics. The same thing with designing stained glass windows. Um, I found, I, I did a couple of designs and then I worked with a stained glass maker who then built the windows. But I learned along the way of how, what's the best way to, to design for that medium, which is, which is a learning skill. And, a, and you have to sort of get over this giant hill to get to the other side where you're comfortable and flexible and able to work in that medium. So I've always been um, always interested in things. I love this, David. David, I want to be respectful of your time. So we'll go ahead and wrap it up. But I would, would you hold your book up one more time sure. for science people? That way on the video, people know what they're looking for. This is science people. And who is the actual author again? The actual author is Lindsay Sinclair. Lindy Sinclair, not Lindsay. Lindy Sinclair. Lindy Sinclair. Uh, and then uh, David Lee Sisko is clearly. Yeah, yeah. So we're Stringer. both we're both called the author of the book, but but she yeah. she wrote the biographies. I understand what you mean. Yeah. So that is fantastic. David, I want to say thank you so much for being on oh, the sure. podcast. I yeah. really appreciate it. And I love the message that you're sharing. And you know, I do hope you know, parents will embrace this and carry it forward and share it with others. So thank you again, David. Oh, I'm, I'm, my pleasure. Um, wonderful to be uh, sharing time with you today. Thank you. Absolutely. Hold on one moment here. <laughs>